welcome back to Deep Learning. So today we want to look a bit into how to process graphs and we will talk a bit about graph convolutions. So let's see what I have here for you. Topic today will be an introduction to graph deep learning. So well, what's graph deep learning? Well, you could say this is a graph, right? We know that from math that we can plot graphs, but this is not what we're going to talk about today. Also, you could say a graph is like a plot like this one, but these are also not the plots that we want to talk about today. So is it Steffi graph? No, we are also not talking about Steffi Graf. So what we actually want to look at are more things like this, like diagrams that can be connected with different nodes and edges. So a computer scientist thinks of a graph as a set of nodes and they are connected through edges. So this is the kind of graphs that we want to talk about today. For a mathematician, a graph is a manifold, but a discrete one. So now how would you define a convolution on Euclidean space? Well, both for computer scientists and mathematician, this is too easy. So this is the discrete convolution, which is essentially just a sum. And we remember we had many of those discrete convolutions when we were setting up the kernels for our convolutional deep models. In the continuous form, it actually takes the following form. So it's essentially an integral that is computed over the entire space. And I brought an example here. So if you want to convolve two Gaussian curves, then you essentially move them over each other, multiply at each point and sum them up. And of course, a convolution of two Gaussians is a Gaussian again. So this is also easy. So how would you define a convolution on graphs now? The computer scientist thinks really hard, but what the heck? Well, the mathematician knows that we can use Laplace transforms in order to describe convolutions. And therefore we look into the Laplacian that is here given as the divergence of the gradients. So in math, we can deal with these things more easily. And that was my 1987 diploma thesis, which was all about that. So this then brings us to this manifold idea. We know how to convolve manifolds. We can discretize convolutions. And this means that we know how to convolve graphs. So let's diffuse some heat. So we know that we can describe Newton's law of cooling as the following equation. So we know that the development over time can be described with the Laplacian. So f of xt is then the amount of heat at point x at time t. Then you need to have an initial heat distribution. So you need to know how the heat is in the zero state. And then you can use the Laplacian in order to express how the system behaves over time. And here you can see that this is essentially the difference between f of x and the average of f on an infinitesimal small sphere around x. Now, how do we express the Laplacian in discrete form? Well, that's the difference between f of x and the average of f on an infinitesimal sphere around x. So the smallest step that we can do is 
actually connect the current node with its neighbors. So we can express the Laplacian as a weighted sum over the edge weights Aij and this is then the difference of our center node Fi minus Fj and we divide the whole thing by the number of connections that actually are incoming into Fi. So this is going to be given as Di. Now, is there another way of expressing this? Well, yes. And we can do this if we look at an example graph here. So we have the nodes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. And we can now compute the Laplacian matrix using the matrix D. And D is now simply the number of incoming connections into the respective nodes. So we can see that node 1 has two incoming connections, node 2 has three, node 3 has two, node 4 has three, and node 5 also has three, node 6 has only one incoming connection. And what we else need is the matrix A, and that's the adjacency matrix. So here we have a one for every node that is connected with a different node, and you can see it can be expressed with the following matrix. Now we can take the two and compute the Laplacian as D minus A. So we simply element-wise subtract the two to get our Laplacian matrix. This is nice. So we can see that the Laplacian is an N times N matrix and it's describing a graph or subgraph consisting of N nodes. D is also an n times n matrix and it's called the degree matrix and describes the number of edges connected to each node. A is also an n times n matrix and it's the adjacency matrix that describes the connectivity of the graph. So for a directed graph, our graph Laplacian matrix is not symmetric positive definite. So we need to normalize it in order to get a symmetric version. And this can be done in the following way. So we start with the original Laplacian matrix and we know that D is simply a diagonal matrix. So we can compute the inverse square root and multiply it from the left hand side and the right hand side. Then we can plug in the original definition and you see that we can rearrange this a little bit and we can then write the symmetrized version as the unity matrix minus D. And here we apply again element wise the inverse and the square root times A times the same matrix. So this is very interesting, right? So we can always get the symmetrized version of this matrix even for directed graphs. And now we are interested in how to use this actually. So we can do some magic. And the magic now is if our matrix is symmetric positive definite, then the matrix can be decomposed into eigenvectors and eigenvalues. And here we see that all the eigenvectors are assembled in U and the eigenvalues are on this diagonal matrix lambda. Now these eigenvectors are known as the graph Fourier modes and the eigenvalues are known as the spectral frequencies. This means that we can use U and U transpose in order to Fourier transform a graph and our lambdas are the spectral filter coefficients. So we can transform a graph into a spectral representation and look at its spectral properties. So let's continue with our matrix and now let X be some signal, a scalar for every node then we can use the Laplacian's eigenvectors to define its Fourier transform. And this then is simply x hat, and x hat can be expressed as u transpose times x. Of course, we can also invert this, and this is simply done by applying u. So we can also find for any set of coefficients that are describing properties of the nodes, the respective spectral representation. Now we can also describe a convolution with a filter in spectral domain. So we express the convolution using a Fourier representation and therefore we bring G and X into Fourier domain, multiply the two and compute the inverse Fourier transform. So we know that from signal processing that we can also do this in traditional signals. Now let's construct a filter 
And this filter is composed by a kth order polynomial of Laplacians with coefficients theta i, and they are simply real numbers. So we can now find this kind of polynomial that is a polynomial with respect to the spectral coefficients and it's linear in the coefficients theta and this is essentially just a sum over the polynomials. So now we can use that and use this filter in order to perform our convolution. So we essentially have to multiply in the same way as we did before. So we have the signal, we do the Fourier transform, then we apply our convolution using our polynomial, and then we do the inverse Fourier transform. So this would be how we would apply this filter to a new signal. Now what? Well, we can convolve x now using the Laplacian as we adapt our filter coefficients theta. But u is actually really heavy. Remember, we can't use the trick of a fast Fourier transform here. So it's always a full matrix multiplication. And this might be very heavy to compute if you want to express your convolutions in this type of format. But what if I told you a clever choice of polynomials cancels out u entirely? Well, this is what we will discuss in the next session on deep learning. So thank you very much for listening so far and see you in the next video. Bye bye.